Hello, my name is Alan Winfield. Welcome to this introduction to robot ethics. Now the talk will be divided into three parts. The first two are about why and how we roboticists must be ethical in the way that we design and operate our robots. The third part is about how robots themselves could behave ethically. So what does a, a robot ethicist do, a professor of robot ethics? Well, the short answer is I worry. I'm a kind of professional worrier. And, um, uh, and I'm going to be describing uh, for you um, in the first part of this talk some of the things that I worry about. In other words, some of the issues, some of the problems in robot ethics. Uh, but of course, worrying isn't enough. Uh, so I'll also talk about the things that we're trying to do to mitigate um, those concerns, those worries. Um, and so, uh, but before I um, get into the, the ethics, I just want to um, introduce you to an important aspect of, of, of the, um, the, the landscape of robotics, which is that there's been a major transition in robotics um, over the past, uh, I would say, um, 15 to 20 years. Uh, so uh, for many years now, uh, certainly since the 1960s, we've had what I call first wave uh, robots. And uh, you can see on this slide examples, uh, the earliest robots to be deployed, deployed in the real world were assembly line robots of the kind that you see here, uh, car assembly lines. And then not long after that, robots um, found their way into warehouses. Warehouse automation is a major application of, of robotics. And of course, also robots in um, defense applications. Uh, this is a, a, a robot used to um, find unexploded ordnance. In other words, to help uh, soldiers um, look for bombs, unexploded bombs, without actually having to physically go near them. And although it may surprise you, um, the Mars rovers, which of course are fabulously successful robots, um, are first wave robots. Um, now, the thing that characterizes all of the first wave robots is that they are either dangerous to be around, and that's certainly true uh, for industrial robots and, and warehousing robots. Um, and typically humans are kept away from these kinds of robots, or they operate in dangerous environments or indeed environments that are simply inaccessible at present to humans like the surface of Mars. Now the second wave of robots, which really has uh, developed in the past uh, 15 to 20 years, and now in fact is the major focus of, of robotics research and development, um, are social robots. And these are robots that are designed in complete contrast with the first wave to interact with humans directly, uh, often very closely. So this um, rather splendid picture in the middle is of uh, famous roboticist um, uh, Rodney Brooks from MIT and a robot that he and his company developed called Baxter, which is designed for um, a robot worker cooperation or, or cobotics, it's sometimes called. So the idea is that this is a robot that you'd use on, um, on flexible uh, manufacturing and the robot would literally be a workmate to human beings. Um, and they would be able to share the same space and interact as part of the, the overall uh, work of the, uh, of the production. So um, on the left, you can see the Paro robot, which I'll return to a little later. It's a therapeutic robot, a kind of surrogate pet. And then there's um, uh, the iCub here, which is a learning robot. Most robots in the world do not learn at present, but this one is developed particularly to explore learning um, uh, in a humanoid robot. And then there is uh, the Festo uh, robot dragonfly there. And that really illustrates that another feature of second wave robots is that they're often biomimetic. Um, uh, in other words, either inspired by designs from nature or um, literally mimicking, uh, as in the case of, of both uh, the Paro uh, and this uh, robot dragonfly. 
So this major transition um, is important in robot ethics because uh, second wave robots have far more potential um, for ethical concerns, which I'll, I'll um, obviously tell you about um, in this lecture. But just quickly, I want to define what I mean by a robot. It's important that we're all on the same page. Uh, and I define a robot very, sim very simply, very simply, 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 artificial intelligence. In other words, an AI, an intelligent system within a physical body. And that typically um, has sensing. In other words, a, a robot can typically sense the environment that it's in um, and then purposefully act on the basis of that sensing and of course whatever plans it has, whatever motivations it has, and then act, physically act in the world. So this is the what we call the sense plan action loop. And of course the planning is the thing that's done by the embedded AI. So really robotics and, and many roboticists uh, disagree with me when I, I say this, but I think it's true. Um, robotics is really a subset of artificial intelligence. It's the subset that is embodied, that's physically embodied and in the world. So having uh, defined what I mean by a robot, let me define robot ethics for you. It's very simple. It's just um, a concern with the ethical impact of robots on individuals, society and the environment and how any negative impacts can be mitigated. So let me now um, turn to uh, or go into worry mode and share with you um, some, not many, because there are, there are lots of things to worry about in robot ethics, but I'll share a few of those uh, ethical concerns. The first one is around accidents. Now, accidents happen, of course, and they're just as likely to happen with robots as, as with any other machinery. And some accidents, of course, are very high profile. Uh, the one um, just pictured here is um, now famous, or you could say infamous, is the, the first known fatality um, of um, a driverless car. We, we sometimes call these autonomous vehicles. Um, and um, uh, the, the driver, well, the, I say driver because he wasn't actually driving the vehicle at the time, um, was killed uh, uh, when the, the um, car's autopilot failed to see a, a trailer uh, crossing the, uh, the road in front of the, the, the car. So it was a failure of the, of the perception uh, systems, the, if you like, of the artificial intelligence. Although um, in a sense, the driver uh, sadly uh, was also partly to blame because he should have been paying attention. And um, in a sense, one of the ethical, there are many ethical problems around autonomous vehicles. One of them, uh, is that um, we have no standards yet for um, approving and certifying the safety of driverless car autopilots, which means that, that when they're in use in the real world, which they are, in my view, prematurely, um, the human driver is still required to be paying attention at all times in order to be able to take over um, if there is a problem. And uh, sadly, if you don't, uh, keep pay attention, uh, and that's been the case of, of, of a handful of, of, of fatal accidents, um, then um, the consequences are very serious, can be very serious, because simply because the technology is nowhere near ready uh, for full hands-off um, autonomous driving. Now, um, Social robots more generally, and I should say that a, an autonomous vehicle is an example of a social robot. Um, it may not look like a robot in the conventional sense, but it certainly is. It has all the features, sensing, artificial intelligence and actuation. But social robot accidents generally go unreported. Uh, and it's, it's unusual that we find out about uh, ro uh, accidents like uh, this one, in July 2016, uh, this security robot um, injured, not seriously injured, fortunately, a child. And it happened to make the national press in the US, which is the only reason we know about it. And in fact, um, a major part of my current work in robot ethics is coming up with 
with procedures, processes and procedures for robot accident investigation. I believe it's a major oversight that at present we have no systems, no processes, no protocols for finding out what went wrong when accidents happen with robots or, or indeed near misses, because near misses are just as important in accident investigation uh, as, uh, as actual serious accidents. Okay, let's um, move now to my next um, uh, uh, ethical concern. And this is um, a rather cute um, robot baby seal. It's a baby heart seal. Uh, it's a Japanese robot. In fact, I took this uh, movie uh, while sharing a, a vehicle uh, in Japan several years ago with this robot. Um, now the robot uh, is uh, used typically to offer uh, comfort to, um, to elderly people, particularly elderly people in care homes or after trauma. And it was used very successfully, for instance, when elderly people had to be evacuated from uh, Fukushima after the tsunami and the nuclear accident uh, at the Fukushima uh, power plant in 2011, um, and has, has been shown to be very effective in studies. The, the therapeutic value of um, uh, this robot has been uh, proven, uh, but nevertheless, we need to be concerned about the ethics uh, around dependency. So is it ethically acceptable for um, an elderly person to become attached, emotionally attached to a robot? Now, that's an open question and, and you know, we could debate it and, and I hope we perhaps will. Um, but um, it's something that, that robot ethicists uh, are certainly concerned about. Addiction is possible in extremists, um, uh, dependency, perhaps over-trusting. Uh, believing that the, the robot actually has uh, feelings for you, actually cares for you, is uh, another uh, possibility, um, a consequence of, of these kinds of, of social robots. But perhaps we can talk about this uh, in the Q&A a bit later. Here's another concern. Um, we already have pretty sophisticated smart robot toys like these, the uh, Anki Cosmo robot and the Texter robot puppy. Um, now, these uh, are really very sophisticated and, and, and often highly educational, but uh, there are several things we need to worry about. One is privacy because they're typically internet connected devices. So we should be concerned about the extent to which um, uh, uh, data, uh, uh, voice and, and, uh, and images uh, of our children is being um, collected and, and, and stored in the cloud, stored in the internet. There's another concern which uh, arises from the, the fact that some of these robots uh, actually do uh, automated facial recognition. And um, I heard a case uh, from a colleague in the lab uh, in the last year where a child or, or a number of children, I think five or six children were uh, playing with one of these toys, uh, and the robot um, reliably uh, identified the faces of five of them, but, but for reasons unknown, the facial recognition system um, would not uh, uh, recognize um, the other child, one of the children. And of course, uh, uh, he uh, or, or she, I don't know whether, whether it was a he or she, was extremely distressed uh, by the fact that the robot Singular, singularly would not recognize them, whereas it recognized the others in the group. Obviously extremely distressing for that particular child. So that's another uh, potential uh, ethical concern with robot toys over and above that of, of privacy. So here. Yeah. Oh, are you surprised that I'm a robot? Take a look at me. I'm just like a human, don't I? Well, it is really hard to recreate a robot which looks just like a real human. Now, this is um, uh, uh, quite an old robot. It's more than 10 years old. Uh, a robot, um, humanoid robot, Actroid, as it's called in Japan. Um, and uh, here I want to illustrate um, 
a particular, it, you know, you could think of it as kind of a niche uh, ethical concern uh, because of course, not many real world robots look like humans, but nevertheless, um, it's an interesting one because uh, as you can see with these uh, images, we can build amazing Android robot bodies. And this face here is actually the face of a robot. Um, it's a robot double um, uh, modeled um, and commissioned, in fact, by this Danish professor, Henrik Schaefer, um, who's particularly interested in, um, in you know, the psychology, if you like, of, of these um, uh, robot uh, body doubles or doppelgangers, you could think of them. Um, now, the problem is that these robots are a deception. Um, in fact, I'd go further and I'd say that we shouldn't be building them at all until such time as we can actually build an artificial intelligence that matches the expectation of their appearance. In other words, if you, if you look at a robot like this, I mean, if you saw uh, this robot uh, sitting in a room, um, uh, you'd assume it was a, a human being. And of course, uh, right now, if you interacted with the robot, um, as in the case of the Actroid up close, you'd very quickly realize this is not a person, but um, a robot. And so we have this, um, what I call the brain body mismatch problem, that we can build the bodies, but we simply cannot build the brains and, and probably will not be able to build the brains to match human uh, intelligence for, well, in my view, um, hundreds of years. Uh, I mean, some uh, other uh, roboticists and uh, AI uh, researchers think it's much sooner, but I, I think they are being overly optimistic about the, uh, the difficulty of building human equivalent artificial intelligence. So um, I talked about first wave robots and of course, first wave robots did impact jobs. They have impacted jobs. Um, but uh, the, the counter to any concerns about that uh, impact, um, and it's certainly true, is that the net effect of first wave robotics automation has been to increase the number of jobs uh, in society. So, so the net, if, I mean, it, it's, it's tough if you, if you happen to be one of those who lost a job on a car assembly plant, but overall, um, the, the, uh, the number of jobs and the amount of wealth that's been created has increased. So um, people are generally not so concerned about uh, robots and jobs. I think we should be. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about some examples of, of where we may well see job, jobs uh, displaced in the relatively near future. So uh, here are some pictures of, of driverless trucks. And uh, this technology, this, I mean, the one on the top left is a truck with a cab, a regular cab. The one on the top right doesn't even have a cab. It looks very weird, doesn't it? Uh, it it's completely, um, it can't be driven by a human being, at least not a human being in the vehicle. Um, now, this technology is already pretty advanced. Um, and these trucks uh, have been shown to be able to operate um, quite reliably on um, big roads, on, on, um, on motorways or freeways. Um, and I think that, dri uh, that, that truck drivers, uh, truck driving jobs will be at risk, perhaps in the next um, uh, five to 10 years. Um, they won't be, um, they won't uh, disappear completely, I don't think for a long time, because the technology simply doesn't allow uh, a driverless truck uh, to be able to, to travel from the, as it were, the, 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 um, the start of the journey, the depot, if you like, the, uh, the warehouse um, distribution center to the, the target destination. So I think that, um, that we'll, we'll see uh, an emergence in, in the near future of truck drivers who essentially pilot, pilot the vehicle, drive the vehicle, in other words, manually from the depot onto the uh, motorway. And then they'll engage the autopilot, uh, put their feet up and, uh, you know, drink coffee, read a book or whatever for a couple of hours. And then the autopilot will uh, alert them that um, uh, the truck is getting close to the 
exit of the motorway and then the driver will take over and and effectively pilot um, the the vehicle to the uh, the final destination and this really is rather similar to airline pilots so that's more or less what airline pilots do right now they they're typically responsible for takeoff and landing uh, but in between only for keeping an eye on the on the um, automated uh, systems the autopilot of the aircraft uh, of course uh, truck drivers i doubt will um, uh, will be will will have the same pay and prestige as, as airline pilots sadly um, but i think it will be a disruption to that industry uh, in the near future taxi drivers on the other hand i think are uh, safer for um, for the and the reason for that is simply that um, driving automated driving um, in real world city centers busy streets with uh, with all kinds of chaos going on um, uh, pedestrians cyclists um, uh, you know the police accidents um, uh, buses and 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 so on um, that it's simply impossible so a driverless car simply wouldn't make any progress if it were uh, dropped into the middle of london for instance the city of london and expected to uh, find its way uh, autonomously and efficiently, in other words, without getting stuck um, um, to carry passengers. So I think taxi drivers will be safe, uh, not forever, but, but certainly um, uh, in, I think in our lifetimes, this may surprise you, but I, I think that uh, 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 automated vehicle technology simply uh, will not be ready for um, some decades um, and when I talk to taxi drivers, as I often do, or I used to when we were allowed to, to uh, be out and about, um, uh, I generally tell them that their jobs are, are perfectly safe. And, and you know, even their, their um, uh, younger relatives who drive taxis, uh, jobs will be safe for, for quite some time, I think. What about in healthcare? Um, on the left, you can see a portering robot. It's called an Ithon Tug robot. Um, and it's used for portering in hospitals. It's been widely deployed and certainly is deployed in the UK in several hospitals. But importantly, it's not used for moving people, for moving humans. It's only used for portering, um, for instance, um, uh, uh, medicines. It's used to fetch, autonomously fetch uh, medicines from the pharmacy and bring them to the ward. Uh, uh, and it's also it, it can also be used to uh, to take, for instance, um, uh, bed linen um, or, or waste um, uh, fabrics uh, to the hospital laundry. Um, so uh, a really these are useful functions, and and you know by all accounts it's it's a successful um, uh, robot in in hospitals. Um, it hasn't replaced the traditional portering jobs in the sense that that those porters are still needed. Uh, to uh, move uh, humans around the hospital, but certainly uh, has had an impact, um, perhaps not a measurable, measurable impact on those kinds of jobs. Then, of course, we have uh, assisted living robots, uh, and these robots are, are beginning to appear uh, to provide assistance uh, to elderly people uh, or disabled people, um, and in particular to allow them to live independently at home. Now, uh, you can imagine that we could spend an entire lecture talking about the ethics uh, of care robots, uh, and perhaps we can discuss it again at the end. But um, most roboticists, uh, and I certainly agree, that, that these robots uh, might well be useful in the near future for supporting human uh, carers, but not replacing human carers. The important thing is that these robots cannot provide companionship, they cannot provide um, conversation, they cannot provide that important human contact that uh, elderly people um, or disabled people um, uh, need so badly. And, 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 uh, and, and so, you know, I, I think that uh, what you're seeing is the emergence of an interesting dynamic between, as it were, the parts of the job which can be uh, automated um, and those that, that, that not only cannot but should not be automated so ethics is um uh, is as concerned with what we should not do as what we what we should do so uh that i think 
brings me to uh, the end of, of my very brief survey of, of, of uh, ethical concerns. Um, and I can just summarize them in the, these, uh, this slide. So um, we can uh, summarize these as four categories of ethical harm. So we have uh, physical harm, psychological harm, socioeconomic harm, and that of course includes jobs. And then one that I've not given you an example of here, uh, but, but I uh, perhaps should have done is uh, environmental harm. We should also be concerned about that. So how can these harms be minimized or mitigated? 